Um, so welcome to lesson seven of uh, the digital drawing classes. Um, so uh, today we're going to carry on looking at SketchUp. So you can see that last week we had an introduction to SketchUp and how to use some of the principal tools. Um, and this week we're going to look at how we can use SketchUp to create um, some architectural drawings. So um, today we'll be looking at how to create um, an isometric drawing, um, but the techniques that we use will be able to be used um, in order to create um, other types of drawings such as um, uh, sections, perspective sections, um, 3D views. Um, so so we'll, we'll look at how we can use the skills that we've, we've learned so far with AutoCAD and SketchUp and turn those into some architectural uh, drawings. <coughs> So before we start, I will just um, show you some of the drawing types that we're able to produce um, with SketchUp. So these are all architectural um, drawings that have been created um, by me uh, for my practice, but all of them have been uh, created using SketchUp. So you can see here that there is a, um, a, a quite a simple model of an existing building uh, that's been created in SketchUp. Um, and then the proposal has been added in SketchUp and we have set up the SketchUp model in order to be able to export uh, a, a 2D drawing, a 2D isometric. Um, and then after the drawing has been exported, either as a JPEG or a PDF, um, that image has then been opened up in another piece of software in order to finalize this drawing. Um, I've said on a number of occasions that um, uh, using Digimap as an example, um, when we're producing architectural drawings, particularly presentation drawings for portfolios, um, I think that in nearly every circumstance, we will end up using multiple softwares for a single drawing. So we can model something in um, uh, SketchUp, but we will never show just uh, a screenshot of the SketchUp model, we will either print it out and trace over it by hand, and that tracing over by hand is the other piece of software in this um, example, or we will export um, a PDF or a JPEG from, from SketchUp, and then we'll open it in um, a, a Photoshop, or we'll open it in um, uh, Illustrator in order to um, finalize a drawing. Um, in this instance, you can see that um, the uh, Illustrator textures were used in order to create all of the textures down here. And we'll be looking at that in a couple of weeks. And um, Photoshop was also used in order to add in the shadow, which I'll show you how to um, do um, shortly. So in terms of other drawings that we um, that we can produce. Um, you'll see that there are some more drawings here that all of that have been developed by um, me using um, using uh, uh, SketchUp as the first piece of software. So today we're going to try and produce something similar to this. This is an isometric drawing of, this is the facade of a building. So you can see here's a window, here's a big door with a pivot door there. Sorry, big opening with a pivot door there. Um, and then you can see this is a boundary wall. Uh, there is a, um, a, a piece of uh, kind of landscaping, a concrete bench and some planting. So we're, we're going to produce the, 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 the base model for this and then we'll look at exporting the information um, in order to uh, pick it up in a couple of weeks with, with Illustrator. You can see the, these are other drawings that have been produced using SketchUp as the base, as the initial piece of software. This is obviously a perspective drawing of a, a little building. Again, you can see that the, um, the lines have been created all in SketchUp. Um, and then the shadows have been added uh, from SketchUp, but we use Photoshop to add them. Um, and then all of these little textures have been added in Illustrator. So hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be able to pick up the skills to be able to produce something a bit like this. Again, um, uh, very similar, same project, similar drawing, but we've just used um, SketchUp to create a, uh, a section. 
This is a worm's eye view of the same building. So this is looking underneath the building so that we can see this big piece of uh, steel work um, and how the existing uh, building relates to the new. This is a section. So you can see here that, that um, slightly less uh, Illustrator has been used. So there are you know, fewer lines in this, um, in, in this uh, drawing, but Again, this drawing was created using SketchUp. Then I think this is the final drawing. Again, this is obviously a combination of um, uh, SketchUp and Photoshop in this instance, maybe with a little bit of Illustrator. But you can you can tell from all of the the, the examples that I've just gone through that um, it tends to be a combination of softwares that we use in order to, in order to produce a final drawing. So. In order to start producing the drawing at the beginning, this drawing, we are going to um, open SketchUp. So I already have SketchUp open. If you don't have SketchUp open, then please open it. Um, we, we, last week we talked about the different types of SketchUp. So there's the free piece of SketchUp, the free software that you can use um, through a web browser. Um, that has a limited functionality so it can do most things you can model most things in the free version that you access in your web browser um, but you can't do things like render or export a PDF um, and they're really important things for um, using SketchUp to create an architectural drawing so um, it's probably um, if you are going to use SketchUp then I would recommend using um, one of the versions that allows you to access it as an app or as a piece of software from your computer um, that allows you to export uh, uh, 2D drawings, so PDFs and, and JPEGs. So if we pick up from where we left off last week, obviously here are all the tools along the top of the um, along the top of the workspace. One thing to mention is that if you hover your mouse over the workspace and then right click, so click on the right side of your mouse, there's something here called customize toolbar. If you click on that, you can see that there are lots more um, tools, lots more options that you, can, um, that you can add to your toolbar. So you can see here, all of these um, tools are uh, moving about, which means that, you know, the, the um, toolbar has been activated um, and then you are able to move the tools that you want. You can access all of these anyway, but obviously adding them to the, the toolbar at the top makes them easier to access. Um, so I'm going to just move this terrain here and you can put it anywhere in your toolbar. So I'm going to pop it there. And then when you're finished, done. So you're able to customize your toolbar uh, if you want. So um, you can have a play with that and, and make sure that you have the tools that you um, are happy with. All of the tools to the right of my cursor now, they're all V-Ray tools. So they are uh, rendering tools um, that uh, you have to pay extra for. So V-Ray is a separate piece of software that you get for SketchUp. So you, you download um, the software, you can see you have to pay for it. Um, it is a thing that you have to purchase. What it allows you to do, I think I looked at it last week very, very briefly, is that it allows you to take a SketchUp model and to turn it into a, a, a render or a visual. So you can see here, this is quite a good example of it. This is the SketchUp model on, on the outside, and then you press render, um, and it allows you to get renders of your SketchUp model. So you can see in the background is the SketchUp model, and then you press render. Um, it's a very simple piece of software to use, um, uh, but it is something that you have to pay for separately. So you won't find these tools as things that are accessible in your um, in your toolbar when you right click and customize toolbar. So the first thing we're going to do is use some of the principal tools to create um, a wall. So if you remember 
the drawing that we're trying to recreate here. I'm going to start by creating this solid wall. It doesn't have to be a perfect um, uh, drawing. It doesn't have to be a perfect size because we, we're all going to have different types of drawing. But this is from a building that I've designed, so I know the measurements for it. First thing I'm going to do is click on the orbit tool, pan around. That helps me understand where the planes are, so where the ground level is, what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right. And I'm going to delete this person, this woman, um, just because I don't need her in order to understand scale. Here's the pan tool, which is just another way of moving around the space. So what I tend to do is I end up using a combination of the orbit tool, the pan tool, the eye tool, which is quite helpful. The eye tool keeps you in the same place but moves your view. So that's how I tend to move around the SketchUp um, space. What I'm going to do to begin with is click on the pencil tool, click in my model space, push my mouse um, to the right. See that red line shows that it's on the red axis. If I move the cursor, then it, uh, it falls off the red axis. But if I go near it, it locks on. You push it in the right direction, and I'm going to say that my wall is going to be five meters long. You can see if right in the bottom right of the corner of the, of the screen, if I type 5,000, it appears. I hit enter, and then I've got a, um, uh, a line of five meters. One thing to check is just to make sure that you're all using millimeters. If you go to Window, Model Info, Units. So there's all of these, but this is the one that matters for now, Units. So it's decimal, millimeters, and the precision is to a millimeter. I'm happy with that. So if it's inches or meters, just turn it to millimeters. And you can choose the precision, but I think one, mil one millimeter is good enough for me. You know, you could say 0, 0.0 millimeters, so that means that you can go to half a millimeter if you need to. But that's a good way of making sure that you're definitely um, modeling in the right uh, unit. So we have, um, we have a five meter uh, line. I can check that by clicking on the tape measure and it will hover over the end and then hover over the other end. And if you look in the bottom right hand corner again, or next to the tape measure, it says five meters. So I know it's five meters. Now in order to draw a, line, a wall that is 30 centimeters wide, I can do one of two things. I can either click on the pencil tool, hover over the end of the line, push in the green direction. So I know that it's definitely 90 degrees from the line that we've already drawn and just type in 300 and hit enter. So that's definitely 30 centimeters. Or a tool that is really helpful often is this tape measure and this protractor. And they're guides and they allow you to set out guidelines to then draw over. And the reason that's really helpful is you can do things like this where you click on the line, push in the direction you want to go in, type 300 and hit enter. And it just means that you know that whenever you draw a line anywhere near here, it will snap and it's definitely 30 centimeters from this line. And you can do the same here. You can zoom in, click on the line, and that's just telling the um, tape measure where to start. Push in this direction and type 5,000 or and hit enter and that will work. Or what you could do is click push in the right direction, and then when you get near the edge, it should snap. And that is the way that you know that you're drawing a five meter line. And then it should snap when you hover over and then snap there. So the tools are really helpful. The, 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 me the tape measure and the protractor are incredibly helpful when drawing out something. But we now have a line that is five meters long. Just press escape to stop using the tape. And 30 centimeters wide or 300 millimeters wide. And again, I'm going to hit escape in order to stop using that tool. So that's the base of our, um, our wall. 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull the wall up so that it is three meters high and then three and a half meters high, the highest point. So we're going to use the push pull tool, click on it, drag it over and you can see it shows you what face you're going to pull because it highlights blue with the little dots. Click to say let's start using and then you can see if you pull the mouse in the right direction it will go in one of those. Just make sure that it's up instead of down and you can type in 3000 and that creates a wall. I'm just going to click orbit and spin around it. That has created a wall that is 5 meters long, 30, meter, 30 centimeters wide and 3 meters tall. And now I'm going to go over to my pencil again and if I hover over, you see it snaps at the end, if you hover over the middle it also snaps at the midpoint. So if I click on that, push over, it should snap at the other midpoint, click again. So now what I've done is I have identified a point, I've split that top face in half so now I can push one bit and leave the other down. So I'm just going to push that up and then type 500. So that is the edge of my building, that's the elevation of my building. Now at this point, really important to remember to triple click and that selects everything. Remember if you click once, it selects the thing that you are touching. If you click twice, it selects the face and anything that touches it. And if you click three times, it selects everything that is attached to where you've just clicked. So if you click three times and then right click, make group. And what that does is that means that this face has been grouped. In order to carry on editing it, we just have to double click to open the group. And then we can click out to close it. Just means that as the model begins to get more complicated, we can manage the model a lot better because this face will be editable separately to the wall and to the patio. So this is the elevation. What we can do now is obviously we're spinning around. You can see here that this line is perspectival, this line is perspectival. That's because we've got our camera set to perspective. So camera perspective. If we go to parallel projection, you can see that it's turned into a, an orthographic parallel projected drawing which is what we want for an isometric. You can even, here if you go to camera standard views, ISO, it will give you the perfect ISO um, positioning. And when you're happy with the view, we can save that view so that we can always come back to it. The way that you do that is you go to view, all the way down to animation, and then add scene. You can see here a little tab has appeared at the top. It says scene one. I'm going to right click on it and rename it ISO and hit, en hit enter. So that is my view saved. So that means now I can change the camera type to perspective. I can spin around. I can do whatever I want. And whenever I want to go back to that view, I just click on the tab and it takes me back to that view. So it means that you can set up the drawing. You can know where the drawing is going to be, what angle you're going to view the model from, and then continue to work up the model um, uh, in the areas that you know you're going to have to you're going to see it once it's completed. So that's the first part of the view defined. The next thing is to check the style is what you want. So if we go to window. And you see here styles. It's got a little line against it because it's actually already open on my page. But if it's not already open for you, then you can just click on it. And this dialog box will appear. You can see there are lots of different styles. Default styles. But you can also look at sketchy edge. You can see here it changes how you view the model. So... There are lots of different styles of SketchUp model, which is quite useful. And if you've got an older tutor, they'll probably think that you've drawn this by hand. But if you click back, it'll take you right back to the old style that you had. 
if I go from sketchy edges to default. There are lots more that you can have a look at, but the one that I think is best is this. It's in default and it is hidden line. And it just gives you a, a white background and black lines. And it's very easy to see and to read. And when you're happy with the choice of style, you can right click on the tab, your screen tab, right click and update. That means that now, every time you click on that tab, it will take you back to this view. A couple of other things to, to explain. Um, I'm just going to draw a cylinder just for you to be able to see. So if I draw up the cylinder, you can see that the um, harsh edges of the shape are visible, but when you have a curved shape, SketchUp doesn't sh automatically show the edges of the circle. In order to make those visible, it's obviously really important if you're trying to draw an isometric, you can edit the style. So if you clicked on hidden, hidden line, go on edit and go to profiles. You can see that now the edge of a shape is visible. I'm just going to right click and update again, update scene. So it means that I'm, we don't need this, I'm going to delete it. But it means that now, if there are ever any curved lines in our um, model, then the edges will be visible, which is really important. And the last thing that I'm going to do is show you shadows. So you can either find your shadows in window and then down here, shadows, or it's already open in mine, but I'll click here anyway. And then this dialog box appears. And this is really clever and something that I think is really good about SketchUp. Uh, if you click this little box, shadows turn on or turn off. So you can turn them on and turn them off. UTC minus seven is, um, this is supposed to dictate the, your location in the world. I just always keep it at this and it seems to work. Um, and then there are two more um, uh, variables that you're able to change. This is the time of day. So you see if you shift it along, it responds to where the sun would be at that time of day. And then this is the time of year. So you can see in the winter, the shadows are a lot longer because the sun is lower in the sky. And then if we come to the summer, this is almost midday in the summer. That's when the shadow is the smallest. But you can see that the shadow changes according to the time of day and the time of year, which I think is really, uh, really clever. So I'm just going to, I've just randomly got it to 1.44 p.m on the 4th of the 7th. It's an American piece of software, so they've swapped the um, the month and the day, but it's the 4th of the 7th. So it's the middle of summer at 1.44 p.m. and that shadow looks good to me. So again, if I want my shadows visible and I'm happy with that time, right click and update. That means that that scene will now remember this is how I want it to look. So in order to carry on modeling, I'm going to turn it back to perspective because I find that easier to model. I'm now going to guide, show, create the guides for the windows. So I'm going to create a line. I'm going to click on the edge, pull it along, and then it should snap to this point. So now I know that whatever I draw here is perfectly in line with this, which is really important. And then I'm going to click on the bottom edge, push it up, the blue line, confirms that we're going in the right up and down axis. And then I'm going to type 450, which is the height of a seat, and hit enter. And then I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to show the, I'm going to push the, the, the guide in 450 millimeters, 450 and hit enter. And then from the top, I'm going to go down 450 and hit enter. And that is the location of my big window. And then I'm going to do the same here. 450 and then here we're going to do another 450. So you can see here that I've been able to get, draw out where I want my door and where, I'm up, where I want my window on the elevation and now in order to, to add the, the window into the elevation and the door into the elevation I just need to click on here and turn that to a rectangle and now if I draw on. The fact that the rectangle is green tells me that it's in the green axis, which is what I want, and click. 
Now, if I try and push and pull, nothing, it, it, it won't subtract itself from this model. That's because I've drawn it not in the group. I've just drawn it separately outside the group. So I can do two things. I can either just delete, open the group, and draw it again. And now this time, it's subtracted from the, the shape. Or I can double click to select the face and the, the, um, the perimeter, and then go up to edit, cut, which will copy it, but it removes it at the same time. Double click to open into my model, into the group, and then edit, paste in place. So I would do this if you've drawn loads and then forgotten that you have um, not drawn it in the group. And now I can just push it through. So I'm going to do, now that I know the group is open, and you know the group's open because this black dotted line appears around the group, and everything else goes a little grayer than normal. And then I'm going to draw my other my window, push it through, and if I go slowly, the point at which it reaches the other face, the back face of my model, it snaps. And as soon as I click, it deletes itself. If I push way back, see, so it's it, this edge is nowhere near here, the back line of the wall. If I click it now, you get this strange, it's created a void, but it's actually kept the back line of, of the, you know, they haven't, for some reason they haven't intersected with each other. So what has to happen is this has to intersect perfectly with this face, click, in order for things to delete themselves. So just make sure that you're doing that correctly. So I've just clicked out of the group in order to um, uh, have the whole model visible again. You can see that we've created this elevation. And if we want to see what it looks like from our ISO view, that's what it looks like in ISO. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw some lintels, so the, the things on top of the windows. In order to draw them, I need to open the group again. And I know that I want my lintels to, I'm going to go to perspective again, because I find it easier to draw in perspective. The lintels need to be 100 millimeters, 100, enter, and 100, enter. So they need to be 100 millimeters wider than the door and the window. 100, enter, and make sure that this little blue diamond is visible on your uh, tape measure, because if it's not, it means that you could be tape measuring, you, should, you could be creating a, a guide on anything, any area. As soon as it's you either have the blue diamond, that means that your tape is stuck onto a surface, or the red line is also confirming that you're in the right axis. Type 100, enter, and now I'm going to go up to my 450 and snap. So now I've got enough there in order to draw my two lintels. And sometimes when you draw over a line, it refills the opening. So you just click on that and delete. There you go. And what I can do is I can either now go to view guides and turn those off or view, view guides, turn those on and I can click in and then just delete the guides. You have to click into the group if the guides are in the group and out of the group if the guides are out of the group. So I periodically just go over and delete these because they start to make the drawing look messy. So the two more things that we're going to model are the patio and the um, neighboring wall, the boundary wall. First thing I'm going to do is draw the boundary wall. So that is here. I'm going to go out by three meters, 3000 and hit enter. And we're, to go, we're going to go up. And remember there are two ways of locking. If, if you're in the right axis, so I, I want the line to go up, you can either hold down the shift button as you're drawing. So that's the arrow pointing up um, on the left of your keyboard. You hold that. You can put the mouse in any direction and it will lock to up and down. If I let go, see, it stops. 
um, or you can go over to the right hand side of your keyboard and press the up arrow and that will also lock into the vertical position and if you click the left hand arrow it will lock into green and the right hand arrow will lock into red so I'm going to press up again because I want it to be in blue and then we're going to go up by three meters again so 3000 hit enter and now I'm just going to hold shift because I'm in the right axis shift and then click just allow it to snap there you go so that's the boundary wall and I'm just going to create a bit of depth for that let's say 100 and hit enter so now we have the boundary wall and the wall of the building that I have done this is in a group you see this isn't in a group so I'm just going to triple click that right click make group so now these are in two separate groups which is good in terms of model management and then the final thing we're going to do is model the patio so you can see I know that this is a rectangle so I'm going to create I'm going to click on the rectangle here go over start it there and then there's my patio so I'm going to raise this up ever so slightly let's say 100 again 100 and then I'm going to turn my shadows off Click on perspective just so I can spin around a bit. Sometimes shadows make your computer struggle with, obviously this is a very simple model, but if your model gets very complicated, then sometimes it's good to turn shadows off just so that your computer is able to um, uh, process the, the actions quicker. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my pencil and just here and here, I'm going to draw a couple of lines just to isolate so I'm press escape so that this blue stops being on the top and then I can, so I can use it here just so I can pull that through I'm going to snap it to the edge of this wall just do that by hovering the mouse over that wall click and then we're just going to turn this into a group as well so that's triple click really quickly right click and then make group so now you can see I've got a wall a, a boundary wall here and a patio and then maybe the one last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, get a bench. I'm going to create a bench. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to use the guide. I'm going to start on this corner. I want the bench to be this wide so that it's in line with the doorway. So I can use that to click on the rectangle, start, pull it over. So that's the top of my bench. So if I just push this up now with the push-pull tool, I'm going to go 50, so the top of my bench is 50. And I'm just going to triple click and make that a group. And then we said that the top of a seat is 450. So I can do two things. I've clicked, I've just clicked on move. I've hovered over the corner, so I'm going to click there. We can start moving it. Now if I hold down on the shift button, we've locked the movement up and down. And now if I hover my mouse over here, it should lock, there you go, to the top of the window seat. So that's how I have been able to make sure that the top of this is the same level as that. It's quite useful sometimes when doing architectural drawings. Obviously now this is a floating bench. So what I want to do is create some legs. And in order to do that, we're going to create a component, which is the thing that you can make one of, then duplicate. And if you change one of them, they all change. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to click on rectangle again, start here, go down, there you go, there's one leg, make it 50 again, so push pull, push it in the right direction, 50 and hit enter. And now I'm going to triple click, right click, and I'm going to create, so make component instead of make group, make component, create. And now if I copy this over, remember by, you can copy by create by clicking on the move tool, hovering over, and then in um, Mac, you hit the option key, which is in the bottom left. Uh, with a Windows, I think it's the control key from memory. And then I can move this over to the other edge. 
There you go. And here's a little trick. If you want to, so I've copied it over, click. If I now type forward slash, which is in the bottom right, you'll see that in the bottom right of my screen as well, the little forward slash has appeared. And then two, what happens is it creates two um, uh, spaces between the components. So if I'd have hit forward slash eight, it would have copied it eight times. Here it's copied it twice. And it fills in the middle. So if I just show you again, click on the, the component, click move, and then hit option to turn it into copy. And then to move it over, my guide is really useful here because it's, it's helping me stick to this line. And then instead of two, I'm going to hit, for some reason that didn't work. So I'm just going to do that again. Option, move over there. And then forward slash eight. You see it's subdivided it by eight. I'm going to keep that because it looks quite good, but obviously you can do as many as you need to. And because they're components, if I click on one of them to open it and amend it, they all change at the same time which is really helpful. So I don't need to change them, but that would be really helpful if it was something that I, I may change in the future. So I'm just gonna click on that axis and delete it. So that is my uh, rudimentary version of uh, the drawing that we did previously. So with the, all of those, um, I am now able to do a number of things. First thing I can do is export a PDF, which we can then play with in Illustrator. So the way that I would do that is I would turn the shadow off. It's really important that the shadow is off and the style is hidden line, which is the one we're in. And it's really important if you have any circular um, uh, elements in your model that the profile profiles is ticked. And then with all of those set up, I can go to uh, the export, which is here, you go file, export and then 2d graphic and this is why you need a sketchup pro or you need um, some sort of um, uh, you need sketchup uh, either either pro or the education version of sketchup with full functionality because you can see here in the export dialog box if i click here you can export dwg files jpegs PDFs, all of these are incredibly helpful, but for this, we're going to use PDF. When you click on PDF and click on options, you can choose how big the image is, how thick the line is. So I'm gonna go 0.25, which is the thinnest line. So I click okay, and I'm just going to say ISO drawing export. So if I Check now onto my desktop. We should have, here's the ISO drawing that we've just exported. And you can see it's a, um, it's a PDF with really nice thin lines. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to do is, um, this is something that's quite useful if you don't have V-Ray. So if you do have V-Ray here, I click on this V-Ray um, button and what that does is it gives me the V-Ray um, uh, dialog box and I can choose how big the V-Ray render is going to be, I can choose um, what materials um, it is, I can do lots of things and if I press this kettle which is the render button I'm able to render um, what we have just created. So if you give it a few seconds, here you go. So it's starting to render the model, um, which is where I get my shadows for some of the drawings that we have looked at. So if you see here, the shadows were actually created in, for this one, the shadows were created in, in just, just in SketchUp. But for some of the others like this, where the shadows a bit more, there's a bit more differentiation between the qualities of the shadows, then this is something that has been created in V-Ray. But if you don't have V-Ray, there is a, a more rudimentary way of creating shadows. So I'm just going to stop that, get rid of that. There's another way of exporting shadow, which is to 
have the view as we have set it up. So let's just make sure we're, we're on the view. And then if you go into your styles, you can actually untick lines. So now you can see you're just left with uh, the shadow and these axes never print. So don't, just forget those axes. Now what you can do is file, export, 2D graphic, and the JPEG of the shadows. So I've just exported a JPEG of the shadows. And now if I were to open this in SketchUp, in Photoshop, sorry, we'll have a look properly in a couple of weeks. I think maybe next week is the Photoshop uh, lesson, actually. You can check here. So it's InDesign next week and then Photoshop the week after. But if I open this up in Photoshop very quickly, show you what we're working with. Here are the lines that we've just exported as lines. And then if I open up the shadow as we exported it, with a little bit of playing around, you can see that I would be able to make the shadow of the model fit with the shadow of the lines. So it takes a bit of time to get the, the line and the shadow perfectly matched up. But you can see that this is the this could be the start of a drawing with shadow and we can play around with things like the saturation or the opacity of the, the shadows to, to get it how we want. But in, in, in light of not having V-Ray, th this is a way of being able to create um, a good drawing. So in terms of being able to prepare drawings in, um, in SketchUp, the one thing that I would say is um, any line that you want to have seen in any of your drawings, you need to draw in SketchUp. So let's say here we wanted this to be made out of a patio um, uh, material. What I would need to do is draw the lines on here, physically draw them, um, instead of relying upon a um, uh, a paint fill, you know, or a different material. If we go to the paint bucket and then go on stone, let's see what we get. Uh, or brick. Here we go. Let's say we wanted a brick paver. We could do that. But when we export it, we will not get that. Um, we, those lines won't be visible if we're trying to do a drawing like this. Or like this. So all of these lines, all of these brick lines were drawn in SketchUp. So we need to be able to draw everything that we want visible. So I'm just going to paint that again. Go to colors, go down to white, and then fill it with white paint. So that I've gotten rid of that. If I want anything visible, I need to um, I need to be able to um, duplicate it and draw it. So I'm going to do the same thing I did with this in that I'm going to hit option to turn move into copy. I'm going to pull it across, snap it there and then press forward slash eight. And there's some lines there. And then I'm going to um, select some lines across here. You can see that because this line has been drawn, the line that was continuous across here has now been split. In order to select a number of things at once, you have to have your selection tool and then hold down shift as you're clicking and that will allow you to select multiple things. See this plus or minus means if you click on it again, it deselects it and if you click on it again, it selects it. So I selected all of those and then I can do the same thing again. Option in order to turn move into copy, pull it across to here and then divide by 10. There you go. Now I have lines drawn on the patio. 
The reason I've drawn those lines is because if I want to export a PDF of this in order to um, in order to have here we go in order to have um, uh, a PDF drawing of this in the future, um, I need to have these lines drawn. So now if I export 2D graphic ISO drawing two, make sure it's uh, PDF export. you'll see that the patio lines have now exported as well. And that means that when we're in Illustrator or Photoshop, we have lines to work with. So it just means that whenever you're drawing, you have to have lines drawn in order to be able to, um, in order to be able to, to, to use them in other pieces of software. You see here, because I've modeled everything in groups, I can actually hover over this and it doesn't delete because I only have this group open. I'm just going over and I'm deleting these lines because I just want to show what happens if we export um, something with a uh, texture uh, instead of lines. Um, it can sometimes look good but it's a lot more difficult to adapt in uh, another piece of software which is what we've been talking about quite a lot uh, in this lesson, one of the important things when creating um, a an architectural drawing is to be able to is to um, create something that is in you know a, a number of um, pieces of software. So I've just changed the style so that we're able to see it. And now if I export this as a PDF, we'll see the difference. If I just go to my desktop to show you what it looks like. Here it is, really bad. And actually when you open this in Illustrator, you, you're unable to delete these dark gray bits and it means that it's unusable in Illustrator. Whereas when we open one of these files in Illustrator, I'll just do that now very quickly to show you, but obviously we'll concentrate on it in another lesson. When you open this drawing in Illustrator, you're able to select individual lines and to delete them where necessary. So if I just zoom in and say that I want this bench to be continuous, I'm able to click on the lines. Again, I'm holding shift down in order to click on multiple lines at once. Press delete. You're able to neaten up your drawing on a line by line basis, which is really helpful when we're trying to um, uh, create a, a nice architectural drawing. And we'll look at this in a lot more detail in a few weeks. But again, if you hold down shift whilst you're selecting, you are able to select lines, change the weight of the line and create architectural drawings like that. So we'll look at that in, in more detail in a couple of weeks. Um, but in terms of being able to use SketchUp to create 3D drawings, um, the principle is that every line that you want to have seen or to use in another piece of software, you have to draw. Um, and that uh, hidden line is really important. Being able to create scenes is really important. So if I go back to perspective, I spin, and this may be another scene that I want to have. I'm able to, um, this is quite useful in, in, in terms of being able to create a scene. If I click on this position camera tool, this creates a person in the space, and then it automatically turns to the eye, which means that you're able to have a look around and then if you click on the footprints next to it it's almost like you're in a first person game in that you're if you click down and move your mouse you can walk around so you can actually move towards your drawing your model you can spin away so you can walk around your model using this and then if you want to change the angle of the view you can do that and then when you've created the second view that you're happy with, this is my second view that I'm happy with. 
you can see the eye height is set at 1676.4, so it must be kind of average eye height. If you want that to be slightly lower or higher, you can just type in to change the eye height. And then the last thing that I always do with a view is go to camera and then turn it into a two-point perspective or a parallel projection, whatever is appropriate for the drawing. This is a perspective, so I want it to be a two-point perspective. And that doesn't do much, but what it does is the, these vertical lines become truly vertical, which is what you want for an architectural drawing, as opposed to this, where if you look now, if I move slightly, the angle of the line, these they, they're not perfectly vertical. They're ever so slightly off. It's not very visible here, but if we spin around and do a drawing like that, you can see that this line, instead of being vertical perfectly, it is um, perspectival. If we wanted that to be a two-point perspective, we would do something like that. Obviously, that looks kind of crazy because it's not the, the right view. If I click on this view, it takes us back to all of the views that we have had, which is this one, two-point perspective. I'm going to right-click and add scene. So now I've got two scenes. I'm going to rename that. This one is my view, and this one is my perspective. So everything that we've done with the previous view in terms of exporting uh, and being able to use it in a different piece of software, we could also do with this as well. So that is um, where I think that st stopping with SketchUp is, is good for an architectural drawing. Obviously, we looked at things like 3D Warehouse, which is the website where you're able to search for and download props for your models. Be really careful when you're doing this because if you do too many, they can look really bad, um, but they can sometimes be useful. For example, if I look at a nice chair, maybe this would look quite good in my view or this would look quite good in my view. So I could just download that as a 2020 model and then open it here. Double click to open, just find it in your downloads. And if I do edit copy, and then edit paste and drop it in. There is a chair in my view, which might be quite good. I can select that and rotate it so that it looks a bit more natural. I can move it somewhere, go back to my view. Brilliant. Go back to my ISO. That looks great. If I did too much, you know, if I started putting loads of things here, it would start to look a bit like The Sims, so I wouldn't recommend doing that too much but you can see here how we'd be able to get shadows from it again it look really good um, so that's it i think for for using sketchup to to prepare some drawings um, i think the, the the idea of being able to use this to set up the lines and then to be able to export it as a jpeg or a pdf and then to open it in photoshop and finish the drawing or to open it in uh, illustrator and finish the drawing or to print it out and to trace over it to finish the drawing and have a hand drawing that has perfect perspectival positioning um, is a really good way of utilizing this tool for architectural drawing so that's it for for this week um, next week we'll be looking at the adobe or we'll start looking at the adobe suite of um, softwares so we'll start with indesign that's because I think that it is the most simple of the three. Um, so we'll be, we'll be looking at InDesign and that's a, that's a piece of software that people who make books and portfolios uh, utilize. So we'll be looking at how to, to, to create a set up a portfolio and then to put your um, information in. The week after we'll be looking at Photoshop. So we will utilize this drawing. So make sure that you save this model i will do it too file save as and i'm just going to save it here for now but i'm going to save my model um, because we're going to utilize the export so if you if you're all able to file export and then a pdf or a jpeg either of those would be great and then when we come to um, when we come to Photoshop, we'll be able to uh, utilize um, the JPEG or the PDF to um, to create 
um, some textures, and then the week after we'll be looking at Illustrator, uh, and we'll we'll be looking at how to create some of these drawings in terms of manipulating line weights and textures.